your argument for today, case 09751, Snyder versus up uh, the Mr. Summers. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. We're talking about a funeral. If context is everyone's matter, it has matter in the context of a funeral. Mr. Snyder simply wanted to bury his son in a private, dignified manner. When his father's behavior made it impossible, Mr. Snyder was entitled to turn to the court hall in the state of Maryland. Why are we just talking about a funeral? Like that's what problems I have in the case. There was also this video that uh, uh, your client uh, watched right later after the funeral. There was a flyer that was sent out prior to the funeral. We had a funeral, and we have what described as the epic, which was put on the internet after what was... What does that have to do with you? As the district court explained, and the circuit court um, followed their law, even in fact, the trial um, confirmed this, that the epic was essentially a recap of the funeral protest itself. That's fine, but it's, it, it does not include the moment of funeral. I mean, you know, you, you either have two separate causes of action. One is the inclusion of the funeral, and the other is the, the uh, harm caused by uh, viewing this, uh, uh, this posting on the internet. But, uh, I don't see how, how they both relate to intrusion upon the funeral. And they were just submitted to the jury as, as one big one. Well, we had four that was sent, that was sent out for um, the funeral. We had the facts of the funeral. And just the epic did, of course, we focused on the personal targeted comments in the epic. Um, and we presented our evidence. Yes, it was. Well, that a funeral uh, uh, protest, just the epic. Would, would that uh, uh, support the cause of action you were sitting here? I think that's a closer call, but when we have the personal. Yes or no? I would say yes, because we had the personal targeted um, epithets directed at the Snyder family. Even though it's, it, uh, you don't have to watch it. It's posted on the internet. That's correct. Just it's his choice to watch them, but he chooses to watch them. He has a cause of action because it causes distress. Well, he has a cause of action. doesn't mean he's going to win. He still has the, the pleading standards, summary judgment standards, and motion to dismiss. Well, why does he have a, a point? As I understand, after this case arose, there are past statutes putting time, place, and manner restrictions. I read that statute and it seemed to me that there was nothing unlawful, nothing out of compliance with that statute that was done here. And there was a concern for this, this, there was no in between anyone going to funeral, stop before the funeral, service began. Am I right that the, under the guard statute, this kind of was not unlawful? The Justice Keeper, the statute wasn't in place at the time, but it's a complicated answer to the question because they were positioned about 30 feet from main vehicle entrance to the church and they rerouted the funeral percent so they're two to three hundred feet away. Did they, did they stand when the police told them to? Well, they, they told the police they wanted to stand, the police said okay. So the police didn't say, please stand here. They said, in fact, they but found a fire. They were there to the knowledge of the police and with permission of the police. It's true, they did not violate any criminal statutes. Is there anything to suggest that the Maryland legislature enacting that statute intended to occupy the field of regulations of the Christians? I believe the leg Maryland legislature uh, made it clear that they didn't want people protesting funerals in general. Uh, but they didn't prohibit it. They pro prohibited under certain circumstances. And which is a switch to that me. For statutory uh, enforcement, but while dealing with here, it's tort law. Isn't that statute applies to any protest? If it's protesting the Vietnam War, protesting whatever your case uh, it involves, at least if we accept your version of it, uh, a, a protest of a, a bit soldier who, who, who's going to hell and whose parents have uh, raised him to go to hell. Uh, so uh, simply to say you can have protest uh, with a certain distance is not to say you can have protest with a certain distance that. Uh, uh, defames the course. Uh, that's that different issue, isn't it? That's our position, yes, Justice Slayer. And, and you, knew, you knew just what was going on. Do you suppose, because it's been done before, that wasn't the very same day they paid in Annapolis and the state capital? They could get those two locations that so day. So they knew what side was going to be. Um, could they have gotten an injunction, you suppose, against this protest? I don't think it could have beforehand because, although you said we knew what the signs were going to be, generally, um, from their pattern, I think we could guess what signs have been, but don't really know the signs going to be until they show up. For example, in this case, they had a sign that said "Free Street Boys." They had a sign that said "I Hate You." You're going to hell. Well, you could go into court and say the sign was this, that, and the other thing. It's the capital. The same sign is in the You're going to use the same signs at the protest. As Justice Skidberg, from our perspective, the signs that say "I Hate You," you're going to hell, refer directly to Matthew Snyder, and we would. Hope and believe the uh, district court could in doing this type of specific targeted epithets. If, if, for example, this was done at a public park in Montana, logically I think we could consider it was directed at the family, but you show up at a 20 year old Marine funeral and say you're going to hell. Did they have going to hell sign and the capital and Alice?
they had the majority of the signs were the same. Yes, I believe the other ones that they changed, they had a sign for each different branch of service. Matt was Marine. Oh, it sounds like you were the whole assignment, the whole lot of signs in there. Maybe. If we're forced to accept the view, yes, Justice Ginsburg, that's what they testify to. Mr. Snyder's view, the view of Fourth Circuit, was the Scott H. Shield, you're going to hell signs, specifically um, referred to Matt Snyder, and thank God for dead soldiers. Um, Mr. Snyder certainly interpreted that as referring to this one, because after all, Matthew Snyder was the only deceased mean slash soldier. Where did the, the Fourth Circuit found that those signs talking to the family rather than a whole U.S. assignment? The guy H. Shield, you're going to hell sign with ones that four circuits said they can avoid um, that issue because they can simply say this is paper poly and protected um, pursuant to his interpretation of Milvich under defamation law and then it's extension of Huss versus Paul one. Do you think that the epic is relevant as an explanation of some of these arguably uh, ambiguous signs or split into the general example? You're going to help God hates you, who is you? If you read the epic, perhaps that sheds light on who you is. It can shed light, but if you put us in the context of a funeral goer, Just Alito, what you have is, it was a typical funeral, family members driving in, and, and well, yeah, but the sign to you, and the argument is made you doesn't mean Matthew Snyder, it means a larger group, and then you have the epic, which is directed directly at Matthew Snyder, doesn't that show, uh, shed light on what you make on his signs? Correct, and that's where it's going to give that Just Alito, the epic specifically, Reference um, Matthew's night by name, specifically reference Matthew's parents by name. Um, so, in our judgment, and the, the defendants testified that he, they sort of explained, at least in their explanation, explained the funeral protest itself. This is not person that is out of funeral. I mean, I understand there was a funeral in it, but the first amendment question uh, seems to be different, possibly a, a broader and different question. Did your client see the signs? I gather from the record he didn't see what the signs were, just like pops of signs. He didn't read anything on the signs, is that right? He didn't read the content, so he hadn't seen so how does how did your client find out that the signs it's top so which he saw at the funeral? When the demonstrators were standing with the approval of the police three hundred feet away, like how did you find out what he said? Your Honor, two days van sent out a flyer and now they were gonna protest the funeral. They had Matthew Snyder's issue there. They claimed they were gonna protest at St. John's Catholic Hall. Did they say in the how, my question is, how did your client find out these very objectionable things on the signs? How did he find out what they said? He found out about the specifics of the signs by uh, going to the family with immediately following and seeing it on the television. Okay, so now we have two questions. One is, under what circumstances can a group of people broadcast on television something about a private individual that's very obnoxious? Because the funeral, you say that uh, I accept that for your point of view is very obnoxious. And the second is, what extent can they put that on the internet where the victim you like to see either on television or by looking it up on the internet? Now, those are the two questions that I'm very bothered about. I don't know what the rules ought to be there. That is, do you think that a person can put anything on the internet? Do you think they can put anything on television, even if it attacks the most private things of a private individual? Does Merlin's does Maryland's law actually prohibit that? You can know it does. And, uh, what should the rules be there? Have I said enough to get tall? <sighs> yes, you're right. Right now, the rule we're stuck with is Hosser versus Falwell, or intentional infliction of emotional distress. And the... You, your claim is that Hosser was a... Falwell was a public figure, and the title family is not. So, I, I think what I got in your proof is you don't fall under... That case because you're not dealing with the public figure. That's correct, Justice Ginsburg. Okay, can you go ahead. Finish that. Uh, you finished answering Justice Breyer. I want to. What more you say about this stuff here will be? Because I'm, I'm very I'm quite in The private target nature of speech and our judgment is what makes it unprotected. So, for example, evidence directed at the family um, would be unprotected. Um, if, for example, a person repeatedly put on the website that Mr. Smith has A's, whether it's true or not, Essentially, at some point in time, it might rise to the level of um, an intentional election. So we've got the other facts combined there. You, so you have no objection if the son said, get out of Iraq, where anti war protests, so it's not directed at this particular individual? Correct. I don't think no there's objection there. I don't think there's any constitutional impediment to bring the Constitution would not uh, would bar the claim going forward. So the intrusion on the privacy of the general out of the case, right? 
because that's how I would enter the one proxy of the hill just as much. It's not really what you complain about. You're complaining about the personal tax, aren't you? Yes, Justice Lee, and I think under a certain scenario, you could have, regardless of the signs, could have a scenario where the funeral disrupted it was disrupted in this case. Um, it was disrupted. It was Justice Lee. I thought that the, the, when the server had jumped began, the protest to stop. The police testified that I think it was about eight minutes after the funeral started that the protesters left the area. Well, according to I think all witnesses, yes, they had they had to in order to avoid protest. That and they certainly took away, according to the priest, was um, coordinating mass. They certainly took away the peaceful experience that all tribe figures. But you wouldn't have affected that if it weren't an anti science You said it. No, I said. I hope I said just clear that under right context, just the signs on a festival where there's a sign out that says God hates America. I don't think that we have a name. But if they in fact disrupted the funeral, I do think that in some set of acts there could be a claim. Um, counsel, I'm trying to tease out um, the importance of um, the the person's private nature or a public figure, or a private person or a public figure. Does it make a difference by directing public comments to a public or private figure? Well, in context of um, defamation, we had Rose Bloom called by the Chris decision. No, I'm talking about in terms of infliction of emotional distress. If I am talking to you as a Marine, if you were a Marine, I was talking about the Iran war and saying that you are perpetuating the horrors of America's human and said other things that were offensive. Would you have a cause of action because you are being called a perpetrator of the American experience? I think there'd be, have to be a lot more facts involved, um, harassing type facts. Um, but you're saying yes. So public speech, speech on public matter, if directed to a private person, should be treated differently under the law? I think that was part of what Justice Breyer was asking. Um, is that what your position is? Public speech, if directed to a private figure, should be treated differently than as directed towards a public official. All right. And under what theory of the First Amendment would we do that? What case would stand for the, our extent for the proposition that public speech or speech on a public matter should be treated differently depending on the recipient of the speech? Birds versus Welch treated public versus private figure status different. Now, the definition was the definition that's false truth for false people. Correct. But the problem is the only other case we have deals with intentional infliction of emotional distress. And for this court, it's Hustler versus Falwell. And Hustler versus Falwell clearly dealt with a public figure. The states have interpreted Hustler versus Falwell as not applying to a private figure. But have they done it in the context of differentiating between public and private speech? Yes, there's a um, Illinois case that we cited in the brief where it was specifically said it was a matter of public concern. And they said the plaintiff was not a public figure. Therefore, um, it just hit the element of intentional infliction. I wasn't talking about state cases, I was talking about a Supreme Court case that suggested that we would treat, um, we would treat the First Amendment and the right to speak on public matters differently, depending on the person to whom it was read. On Gertz as well says that Dunham Street says you have to look at the context of the situation. Well, this goes to the context. Now, going to the context of this speech, do we look at a word on the sign alone, or do we look at the entire context of what all of the other signs said at demonstration? to determine whether or not the speech here was public or private speech. I think you have to look at the particular sign, because if you don't, anyone could come up with a public concern, because they could direct any type of epithets a person in the middle of their paragraph. They could say, I'm for tax, or I'm against taxes, and for the entire... Well, it's not an honorable concern, your uh, apparent acceptance of, of the proposition that if one comes up to a Marine and says, you're contributing to a, a, a terribly unfair war, uh, that that alone would, uh, would form the basis for... Uh, the tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress. But what are the requirements of that? I thought they'd have to be outrageous conduct. Doesn't it have to be outrageous conduct? It does, just clear. It wasn't oh, just clear. I mean, why I got that as, as, as parallel to what to what you're playing here? And I hope I didn't. What I meant to say, if I did, was there would have to be a lot more fast and all rise the level of an intentional infliction of emotional distress because if you told the Marine, for example, you're not in favor of the war. What about the victim? Let's see if you have an instance where the defendant has said on television or on the internet something absolutely outrageous you show that you show that it was intended to and did uh, 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 inflict serious emotional suffering you show that a reasonable person would have known that likelihood and then the, uh, the defense says yes i did that but in the cause in a boss and now 
is because of we're trying to demonstrate how awful the war is. At that point, I think First Amendment might not leave it alone. But if it's not going to leave this alone, here is where we need a rule, or we need uh, an approach, or we need something to tell us how First Amendment, in that instance, will begin to enter, enter and force balancing. Uh, is it that you want to say no, no punitive damages in such a case? Or that you have to insist upon a particularly clear uh, or reasonable connection between the private part of this and the public effort? Have you thought about that at all? Because that's where I'm thinking and having trouble. B, I think the standards be Husser versus Falwell General does not Husser versus Falwell defamation. Um, I thought Husser versus Falwell is intentional. Intentional fiction. Okay, good, thank you. Go ahead. Mr. Summers? Go, go my answer then, please. I think Falwell should be versus Falwell generally does not apply to a private figure unless the defendants can show some compelling connection there. And if you, if you, or at least reasonable rational connection, in this case, they don't even claim their connection. They just use this moment to hijack someone else's private event when they're grieving over a 20 year old child's funeral. Mr. Tempers, um, Husser seemed to me to have one sentence that's key to the whole decision. It goes like this. It says, outrageousness in the area of political and social discourse has an inherent subjectiveness about it, which would allow a jury to impose liability on the basis of the jury's tastes or views, or half on the basis of their dislike of a particular expression. How did that sentence, how is the sentence less implicated in a case about pride figure than a case about a public figure? Well, at least in Husser, um, Justice Kagan, at least in Husser versus all, we had a traditional area of public discourse. We had a parody with, I believe, anyone's great one to explain that. Um, here, what we're talking about is a private funeral. I don't, um, I hope the First Amendment wasn't um, enacted to allow people to disrupt or ask people at someone else's private funeral. Well, that, that goes back to the question um, that was asked previously. Uh, suppose you had a general statute that just said, there will be no disruptions of any kind at private funerals. You know, pick your distance, 500 feet, 1,000 feet. Um, but something that, that didn't revert to context, that didn't revert to ideas, that just made it absolutely clear that people did not disrupt private funerals. Uh, what harm would that statue not address in your case? Well, the states have, in the statutory case, have the interest in penalizing the offending party in court law. The state's interest is to provide a remedy for its citizens. Under the Fourth Circuit's interpretation of these facts, Mitterstein has absolutely the remedy. Uh, the private figure, the grieving father, is left without any remedy whatsoever. We have uh, other instances where part of the law meets all the terms of the statute is to govern. Uh, and yet, um, there's an award of damages committed. I believe that the House of Services Fall Law is a, um, several court but there's no criminal statute, um, alleged. I understand that it went the other way because of public figure status, but that was an example. Um, another example. But that was that I'm asking for an example where it's a federal case where the conduct was committed by the statute, by the police who was there, and yet. Uh, what Justice Conferred, I'm not aware of any case. I think the, so for example, if you sued someone for defamation, there probably would be a statute that was violated, so I don't, uh, I would I'm not talking about this intentional question, 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 the Maryland legislature said this is the, these are the exclusive regulations that apply here. So if someone came up to Mr. Phelps at the funeral and spat in his face, uh, that would not be, that wouldn't be illegal. Justice Leto, I don't know whether that is not specifically prohibited by the statute. But it certainly wouldn't be to the extent that you had to be a lot closer than the Maryland statute. A lot closer than the Maryland statute. Perhaps you'd like to answer Justice Leto's question. I believe that you could um, commit a tort and still be in compliance with the criminal code. Just please, can I, can I ask, I, suppose, suppose, I don't think you have a cause of action for invasion of privacy once people were uh, at this distance from the funeral. But that was one of the causes of action submitted to the jury. Uh, if, if I disagree with you on the cause of action, I suppose uh, I'd have to say it has to be a rebound. But... Of course, I could do it just for you, you have to support both causes of action here, the intentional infliction of emotional stress and the invasion of privacy. Yes, Justice Scalia, but the Supreme Court can agree that the respondents waive that issue by not feeling that issue. Waive, waive what issue? The invasion of privacy. The invasion of privacy. And contest that we met the um, elements of the court. They claim they contest the constitutional issue, but not whether or not we met the elements of the court. All right, and thank you, counsel. Ms. Phelps? 
she does to the mayor of the court in numerous the Wessel Baptist Church entered an ongoing extensive public discussion and wide array of excessive activities taking place in direct connection with the deaths and funerals of soldiers killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. They did so with great circumspection and they did so with an awareness of the boundaries that have been set by the presidents of this court. Ms. Phelps, suppose, um, suppose you, your group or another group or, um, uh, picks a wounded soldier and follows him around, demonstrates his home, demonstrates at his workplace, demonstrates at his church, uh, basically saying a lot of things that were on these eyes or, or, um, uh, uh, other, uh, offensive and outrageous things. And just, uh, follow this person around to day. Does that person not have a claim for intentional affliction of emotional distress? A non-speed activity like stalking, following, importuning, being confrontational could indeed give rise to a cop back. Demonstrations outside the person's home, outside the person's workplace, outside the person's search, demonstrations, non-struggles, saying these kinds of things. You are war criminal, uh, you, what, whatever, you, what, 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 whatever these signs say or worse. My answer, just as Katie knew how I believe that that person should have cause of action, or would under the case have a cause of action. I couldn't give that cause of action without direct reference to the viewpoint, which is exactly what happened in this case. Like this way, we did have a doctor in the biting birds, and uh, you acknowledge that if somebody said, you know, uh, face such as that uh, to his face, uh, that would be protected by the First Amendment. We agree the five words are less protected under the First Amendment. Unprotected. I'll go with unprotected Justice Scalia and if I add this. Five words require eminence, they require proximity, and they require a lack of those words being part of a broader political it, it, Is that so? Do we know that? Thank you, Frank. We know that. It, is it a criterion of the five word exception to the First Amendment that there be actual fight? Certainly not that. Is, is it a requirement that there be a potential for a fight? I doubt. But where, where, where do you get a notion that, uh, that has, there has to be an imminent fight? I get the notion from a series of cases starting within seven years after your Chilpensky case with Gooding case and on down through Brandenburg. Which, which say what? That say that the person's too remote, the fight was not, uh, was not imminent? The, 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 the definition, the working definition of fighting wars is that they have to be wars which by their nature are likely to invite an immediate breach of peace and not occur in the context of some social, artistic, educational, political kind of speech. And if I'm hasty to add just to Scalia, these respondents were not charged with fighting wars. The jury was not instructed to limit themselves to fighting wars. No element of the torts under which liability attached included fighting wars. The words that were at issue in the case were people from church delivering a religious viewpoint, commenting not only on the broad public issues that the discussion was underway in this nation about dying soldiers, about moral but, definitions. But yourself, you, there's no question that these signs that make the signs like that, we saw and you get some more, but you had the demonstration at the Capitol and you had demonstration at Napoli. This is a case about exploring a private family grief. And the question is, why should First Amendment tolerate exploiting this bereaved family when you have so many other for getting getting across that is the very same day you did? several pieces of that, Justice Ginsburg. When I hear the language exploiting the bereavement, I look, what is the principle of law that comes from this court? The principle of law, as I understand it, is without regard to viewpoint, there are some limits on what public places you can go to to deliver words as part of a public debate. If you stay within those bounds and under these authority, but this notion of exploiting, it has no definition and a principle of law that would guide people as to when they could or could not. And if I may... Well, is, it your, is it your argument that there, the First Amendment never allows a claim for the intentional infliction of emotional distress based on speech unless the speech is such that it can be proven to be false and true. Is that your, is that your argument? With, yes, just a little and with a little bit more from your cases that I met, not under an inherently subjective standard and where you're only claiming the impact of the speech was adverse emotion in All right, well, just to give you one example, let me give you another example along the same lines. Let's say there is uh, a grandmother who was raised to son who was killed in Afghanistan or in Iraq by an IED, and she goes to visit her son, her grandson's grave, and she's waiting to take a bus back to her home. And while she's at the bus stop, someone approaches and speaks to her in those vile terms about her son. He was killed by an IED. Do you know what IEDs do? Let me describe it for you. Uh, and I am so happy that this happened. I only wish I were there. I only wish that I could have taken pictures of it. And on and on. Now, 
It's that protected by the First Amendment. There's no false statement involved in his early speech. And, and it may give rise to some writing that's claimed depending on the proximity and the context. And I would have to... Proximity to an elderly person, she really probably not be in the in position to punch this person in the nose. He's a kicker, too. <laughs> that the grandmother had not done what Mr. Snyder did in this case. Mr. Snyder, from the moment he learned of his son's death, went to the public airways multiple times in the days immediately before and immediately after. You know, what is your answer to Justice Alito's question? Do you think the First Amendment would bar that cause of action or not? It would have to be a very narrow circumstance where it didn't, Mr. Chief Justice. So you think our situations where a tort of intentional affliction of emotional distress is allowed, uh, even for a grandmother to make a public disclosure of her son's death? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. 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 Not public to debate, Mr. Chief Justice. That is not the way I understood the hypothetical. You understood hypothetical. The person disagreed with the, the war in Iraq and sent the American crew there. And knew that this elderly woman was the grandmother of a soldier. And I've asked the question in the hypothetical how he knew, which is why I was making reference to what Mr. Schneider did. Microsoft no. selects the grandmother because he thinks that will give maximum publicity to his views. Now, is that, does First Amendment bar that uh, cause of action or not? If the grandmother entered public discussion, the first time the first time. I know that just as Justice Alito knows, grandmother would return from grave or grandson. You can end the public discussion at all. I'm anxious to determine whether in those circumstances you think first in the middle allows that cause of action or not. I'm reluctant to say that it does not, Mr. Chief Justice. However, but you think the answer for that is it's stalking, right? Is it, isn't it possible to stalk? That's what I was trying to look into do, and that's what it sounds more like to me. You get such it satisfies the normal tort or law in stalking for someone to come up to an individual and engage in discussion. I thought a lot more was required. Well, Mr. Chief Justice, I would not file a claim for that person, for that elder grandmother. I'm not prepared without knowing more to say absolutely there could be no cause of action. What I am prepared to say is there would absolutely be much more than that in this well, case. Well, if, if that's the possibility and there's a claim there, then what distinguishes that from this case? Now, I thought you were beginning to say that my hypothetical is different because uh, Mr. Uh, Snyder made his son into a public figure. And the question I want to ask in that connection is whether every bereaved family member who provides information to a local newspaper for an obituary thereby makes the deceased person a public figure. Not the deceased person, just to say, though, we don't allege that the young man dead was a public figure. We if the grandmother called the local paper and said, let me tell you something about my grandson who just fell in, in, in Iraq. Uh, you know, he liked football and camping. Uh, that makes him, that makes her a public figure. Getting closer, and just to say, though, she went on in to say, and how many more parents like me and my ex-wife are going to have to suffer this way? And when will this senseless war end? And I've gotten Congressman Murtha on the phone and talked about the situation. And I'm against the war. And then proceeded to repeat that question in the public airwaves repeatedly. Then a little church where the servants of God are bound say, we have an answer to your question that you put in the public airwaves. And our answer is, you've got to stop sinning if you want this trauma your, to your stop response, happening. Your response to Justice Alito is dwelling on the facts of this particular case. I'm interested in knowing what your position is on the broader question. Can you imagine a circumstance where the same type of discussion is directed at an individual and that would give rise to the board of emotional distress? I can't imagine, Mr. I'm sorry, can or can I can't I can imagine that there could be a circumstance, a hypothetical, where there was not this level of involvement, and it was out of the blue, and it was up close, if I may use the term, a Okay, so if you recognize that there can be a board of emotional distress in circumstances like that, isn't that a factual question of whether it rises to that level of outrageousness, which is part of the court for the jury? I don't agree with the Mr. Chief Justice because you now take an inherently subjective standard with the absence of any of these non-speech misbehaviors. And now you are back to only the only barrier between a person and their First Amendment right to robust public debate, including the court has said, outrageous statements. Is that mean? in I'm sorry. Which is that subjective inherent standard and that objective statement of emotional impact. This court has said repeated. Does it make a difference does make a difference which seemed to me to be the case here? that Mr. Snyder was selected, not because of who he was, but because it was a way to get maximum publicity for your client's particular message. That, that's not a current message, Chief Justice, do with that. Well, assuming it is accurate, does that make a difference? The, the motive of the speaker to get maximum exposure, which every public speaker pines for, looks for, strives for, and is entitled to, does not change the legal principle that's at play. But might affect whether or not the selection uh, inflicts emotional distress for a reason unconnected with the individual who is a subject of emotional distress. Well, if, if a person is selected because, as, as I indicated, he gets maximum publicity, rather than because of a particular connection to the matter of public debate, 
I wonder if that makes a difference. I think it makes a difference when you're looking at what role the plaintiff had in that public discussion and how tied the words that you seek to punish are to his role in a public discussion. I think that's how you get to the point. Well, Ms. Phelps, let's say that we disagree with you <coughs> as to whether Mr. Snyder had at all injected himself into this controversy. Or let's say the case where it's clear that the father of the fallen soldier had not injected himself, not told any newspapers, had not said anything to anybody. But um, uh, uh, group knew that this funeral was taking place and was there with the same signs, with the same... Uh, are, are, you, are you saying that makes a difference? That there, there would be a claim? I'm, I'm saying it does make a difference and no there, was, uh, no, there would not be a claim there, in my opinion, because... But it's not a difference that matters. Is the difference matters in some major I believe just case and this why? I believe it's the umbrella protection under the First Amendment that the court has established firmly. Is speech on public issues. Sometimes you get under that umbrella because the public official or the public figure. But the umbrella that you get the protection for is speech on public issues. Now, when plaintiff comes to your court and says I won eleven million dollars from a little church because they came forth with some preaching I didn't like, I think it does make a difference for the court to look closely at what role did that man have in that public your, discussion. Your argument depends on the proposition that this is speech uh, on a matter of public concern. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, so let me let me give this example. Suppose someone believes that African Americans are inferior; they're inherently inferior, and they're really a bad influence on this country. So, a person comes up to an African American and starts berating that person uh, with racial hatred. Now, is that, this is just any old person on the any old African American on the street. That's a matter of public concern. I think the issue of race is a matter of public concern. I think protein individual up close and in the real to be ripped in. Issue out the zone of protection, we would never do that. Well, everything is matter. Excuse me, that's simply, that simply uh, point out that all of us in Florida, because uh, we have components of our identity, we're Republicans, we're Democrats, or uh, Christians, or atheists, uh, um, we're single or married, we're older or young. Any one of those things, you could turn into a public issue and follow a particular person around, making that person uh, the target of, of your comments, and in your view, because this few maximum publicity, uh, more instant, more removed the person is, the, the, the greater the impact that the Justice Alito hypothetical in, 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 in the grammar. So I, 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 think, I think your, uh, your public concern issue may, may not be a limiting factor in, in cases uh, where there is outrageous conduct and there should be a tort. Well, again, this court has given sub substantial, long-standing protection to feed on public issues. And how could it be gainsaid? that the dying soldiers is not on the lips of everyone in this country, and it is a matter of great public interest and why they're dying, and how God is dealing with this nation, were you to consult the joint appendix and see that at the very same funeral, right outside the front door of the church, where people with flags and signs articulating God bless America, you point, and so this little... Your position is, you can take that and you can follow any citizen around at any point. That, that, that was the thrust of the uh, question from Justice not follow and, 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 and Justice Alito. It seems to me that they're... You should help us and find some mind. Yes, I will help you, Justice Kennedy, and I'm pleased to do that, because we don't do follow around in this church. We were a thousand feet away, seven picketers, a thousand feet away, out of sight, out of sound, not just standing where the police said but, standing. But, in the, but the hypotheticals point out that there can be an intentional infliction of emotional spectacular for certain harassing conduct. For harassing conduct, not for speech, not for public speech, Justice Kennedy. But, and crimes are committed with words all the time. I agree with that. No, there's never been any allegation in this case that the words of the West Orville Baptist Church were in any category of low value or lesser type of speech. Well, let's talk about subjectivity. You're, you're concerned about something. Surely, uh, fighting words is, uh, you know, there's something to fight with that very subjective call it. I believe that your case is given good light on it, Justice Scalia. You don't get subjective. Uh, there may be in some people's mind an element of subjectivity. My 20 years ago. That's solid. Oh, absolutely. What's fighting word? Whereas what, what's an outrageous statement is is, uh, is very much different from what's a fight word. I don't see the difference. Besides which, isn't it the case that in order to recover from the tort of uh, 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 intentional infliction of emotional injury, you have to substantiate the injury with some physical manifestation, which the plaintiff here had. Yeah. And, and my goodness, for fighting words, you don't even need that. You can just say, you know, the, these words anger me uh, to the degree that uh, I would have been inclined to fight. At least for this tort, you have to have physical manifestation. Well, isn't that a very objective uh, standard? Well, be because the court said it was inherently subjective in all of case, and I think that the language that Justice Kagan brought forth, that there's a few more paragraphs that follow, identify what's inherently subjective, and the way this case was tried, 
identifies why the parents objective, where although two sons and then three were identified as actionable by a strained reading of his words, all of the preachments of Westboro Baptist Church, including all of the signs of that picket, all of the signs of other picks and other doctrines, went to a jury with that inherent inherent of what defense depends upon proposition that what is outrageous is uh, more subjective than what is fighting words. Well, Justice Scalia, I must hasten to say that I am not a fan of the fighting words doctrine. I do think it has problems. I just don't think it applies in this case. The court has, has uh, made that a very narrow category, has I mean, we have not allowed the fighting words. So you say that to me, and I'm immediately in the voting country, you know, that it's an instinctive reaction. I think the court has rejected spreading fighting words. Um, and especially not to where there's just emotional injury. That's where I particularly think, although Clancy would have suggested it's in broad language would go that way, but have not gone that way in any of the cases. And again, I have to reiterate, you have required immediacy and an intent. Whether a fight ensues or not, I do understand. It hasn't been pinned down as a requirement. But an intent, that your purpose is to mix it up with somebody. Not to bother and say, Nisha, hear this little church. If you want them to stop dying, stop sinning. That's the only purpose of this little church. A thousand feet away could not possibly so we're so worried about the statements on television, on the internet, and the knowledge there. And I'm not, I'm starting, I'm trying to get the same answer from you. I was trying to put your, your colleague. Uh, Randa said the right to let alone is the most important. And so he must have been thinking of quibitory, therefore interference with, with uh, privacy. And the First Amendment doesn't stop state tort laws in appropriate circumstances. Right. An emotional injury deliberately inflicted could be one. Well, now I think it's one. But, but I see in some instances that could be abused to prevent somebody from getting out a public message. And therefore, I'm looking for law. Now, let me suggest a couple of what you think may be to some other. You have a judge make the decision since the first time it is involved, not the jury. And the judge could say whether in this instance uh, uh, it was reasonable for the defendant to think that it was important to interfere with the emotional life of that individual. You could say if that was so, there will still be no, there will be no punitive damage. There could be ordinary damage could remove all protection from the defendant in an instance where the defendant nonetheless knew and actively knew that they were going to cause an individual's profit, severe injury, uh, uh, emotional injury, irrespective of their public message. So what I'm doing is suggesting a number of thoughts, of ways of trying to do what I'm trying to accomplish, to allow, allow this sport to exist, but not allow the existence of it to interfere with the important public message where that is a reasonable thing to do. Now maybe this is impossible, this task. But I'd like your thoughts. Thank you, Justice Breyer. And I'm taking that we're taking out the intrusion claim. And I believe that I could offer you a compare and contrast to each James may help us here. On one hand, you have a body of law that comes under heading cat bodies. And you can go into that body of law and read all those cases in one sitting, so to speak, from which you conclude that it is very narrow, it's very limited, and there must be some actual physical sound sight intrusion if you're talking about invasion of privacy. At the other extreme for a compare and contrast, is what they seek in this case, what a trial judge gave them in this case, which is in an unspecified period of time that each individual will call the morning period. No one, any time, any place, any manner, may see any word that that mourner says caused me emotional distress. Why that would kill as much. Family, why the members of the family of deceased the captive audience at the funeral? If, if they were right outside the door like the other expressors were in these exhibits, they might have been. Your body of law about half bodies when you build the all around mass and shoot that outline case recently, taking the picking, where they, by the way, specifically said in footnote 25, this isn't about conduct. You got to be up again. I'll use the colloquial term up in your grill. The term I think the court used was confrontational. Now, you can't be a captive audience with them to someone that you couldn't see. I thought the target of picketing of a person's house is not attacked by the first amendment. What this picketing purpose be directly in front of can be regulated. And even frisbee. And what's the difference between that and picking around the site of the funeral? Proximity, just a little. Because the half body of doctrine has fleshed out in the abortion picketing case, what you were looking at was is it practical for the person to avoid it without having to run on? That's why you said images observable, only a direction you can have errors. Content, get up and goes blind. So it doesn't have to do with whether this is a. What you, what you characterize as a public funeral as opposed to a private funeral, that's not the distinction you're relying on any longer. Not primarily. I'm primarily relying on proximity. I do think that you could have a public event where there was not an element of vulnerability in the people going in. You might even let them up their grill. I don't know for sure, but we don't have to worry about that. And so I, I'm following your arguments that the bulk of your speech in the edit, even the bulk of your signs of involve public speech. What you have not explained to me is how your speech directed at Schneider constituted 
top public speech or speech out of public matter because you're talking about him raising Matthew for devil, teaching him to not to fight the creator to abort and to commit adultery. At what point and how do we take personal attacks and permit those um, as opposed to fully exempt or entitled in some circumstances to speak about any political issue you want? What's the line between doing that and then personalizing it and creating hardship to an individual? I believe that's to go to Mara that a line where it was in this case when the father used the occasion of the son's death to put a question out in the public airways repeatedly. So if we disagree that that made him a public figure, if we view him as a public figure, is that enough to defeat your argument? Not just so to Mara. Assume he's a private, the math is a private figure and you did this. Right. I so mean, explain to how you're protected by Mr. Smith. If without regard to what label is put on a person who steps into the great possession. You want to change my assumption. We assume that he's a private figure. You have then made a public statement and directed personal comments that an individual is a private figure. Well, well, that actionable? I, I don't just so to know. I don't know that I can give you a definitive answer as you friend it. What I can tell you is that I think the court would have great difficulty making a rule of law that whether you call yourself private, public, limited, whatever, you, not the person you're mad out of their words, but you, step into the public discussion and make some public statements, and then somebody wants to answer you. Well, so that, what if, if did Mr. Steiner, the father, become a public figure simply because his son was killed in Iraq? No, Mr. Chief Justice. Okay, so if he didn't I don't know that out, If he didn't take out the usual obituary notice, then this case should come out the other way. It's not the obituary notice, Mr. Chief Justice. He went far beyond that. All right, let's just say he does nothing. He does nothing other than bear his son. Right. He is not of the figure. There's nothing. We don't pick at him. And That's because if he does nothing and it's not publicized, you don't get back some publicity that your clients are looking for. My question is, if he simply buries his son, is he a public figure open to this protest or, or not? I don't know in context of war if I could give a definitive answer to that. It was not an issue of seeking maximum publicity. It was an issue of using an existing public platform to bring up a point that would not be articulated for two years. Well, you know, the Baron had called after a bit, put in the obituary uh, information, and called by the local newspaper and asked for comment. He says, or she says, I'm proud of my son because he died in service of our country. Is that is he stepping into a public debate by doing that? Well, how do you call it, Jess Soto? A sir or anybody has the right to answer that public comment. That is our position. Thank you, Ms. Phelps. Uh, Mr. Summers, you have four minutes for me. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Summers, can I ask you to go back to an answer that you gave to one of my colleagues when you were last up there? You said that a, uh, a more standard anti-war demonstration, God of Iraq, war is moral, uh, at his funeral, same distance, same size times, the more standard anti-war demonstration would be protected by First Amendment from intentional induction of emotional distress. And I'm wondering why that is. If you think that what is, uh, what the cause is the lack of protection here is the kind of long on to a private funeral, the exploitation of a private person's grief, uh, the, uh, the, the appearance for no other reason than gain publicity, a private event. If that's the problem, why doesn't it also apply to a standard, you know, God of Ra, war is wrong kind of demonstration? Justice Kagan, I said, is the one that's a much closer call, and two, I would look to fact the case to see if the funeral itself was disrupted. Um, but that is, in fact, our case. The fact of our case was one that it was disrupted, and two, this personal target, um, Saul's on street. Well, so suppose not disrupted, and suppose, and I know that this is, that you can test these facts, yours weren't wasn't disrupted, that they stopped when you started, that they were a sufficient um, number of feet away from the funeral and so forth. So we're just talking uh, the fact that there are people who, uh, uh, who are appropriating and taking advantage of a private funeral in order to express uh, their views and their influence with all the content and rules. I'd say it's a much closer call and not the... Um, but why is it a closer call? It's a close call because it's not the pers personal targeted nature of the um, attack on the side of family that we have in this case. Does that mean that now we have to start reading each line and saying, um, war is wrong falls on one side of the line, but you're a war criminal falls on another side of the line? Is that what we have to do? I think that, generally speaking, yes, Justice King. The, 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 court, the district court would have to look at the signs um, the district court did in this case and determine which one he believed were directed at the family and which ones were not. There was a comment earlier that all the signs were presented, well, all the signs were presented by the respondents, not by Mr. Snyder. Uh, so we vote. I guess that that kind of call is always necessary under, under the tort that you're relying upon. Conduct has to be outrageous, right? 
credit that always requires uh, that kind of call, unless the tone is, is unconstitutional, is applied to all, uh, all harm inflicted by words. Just the, the element of intentional infliction of mental distress requires outrageous. Well, so that's true, but I was assuming a situation in which the jury found that the war is wrong. Uh, the jury did find that outrageous, and the question was, uh, we're going to reverse that jury verdict because we, because the First Amendment prohibited it. Again, I believe it's a clear call. I would say yes, it's a general statement. It does not disrupt the funeral. It does not target the family. I'd say that this one much clearer call, and yes, it's like the Constitution to prevent that claim to the mind for it. The, um, I said, I'm Thank you, Mr. Summers. The case submitted.